the biggest question I always ask myself when that safety comes up is like, well, where is it that I'm feeling unsafe? Yeah. Like, why am I striving for safety in this? And then also, I think the redefinition, like for me, I've been married. I'm married. <laughs> I've been married. I'm married. <laughs> and um, I think re- re- like we were in this constant redefinition of what our relationship is for us, what we mm. need. And I think it's important to like, even in these social constructs that for a lot of us actually mean something. It's like, okay, this could be, you know, a social construct or this could be a part of, a, you know, a patriarch. Uh, subculture, you know, it could be all of these different labels that, you know, we do need to identify. And then also they could also be things that mean something to us and that's okay too. Yes. But then it's like within that, how do I define this in a way that meets what we need versus meeting what society wants it to mean or what other people want it to mean or what my family says it should mean? Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women, by women, on conversations that matter. I am your host, Thais Sky, international speaker, teacher, and a certified life coach currently working to become a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. Join me here every week as I offer thoughts and interviews on what it means to reclaim your humanness in this messy world. Hello, hello, beautiful humans. Thais Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I cannot wait to share an amazing interview with you in just a few minutes. But before we get into that, I just want to say hi. How are you doing? What's been coming up for you in your life? I love all the direct messages that I've been getting from you on Instagram, letting me know that my words are resonating with you, asking me questions, asking for resources. I love that shit. Um, You're welcome to message me. Uh, And if there's a question that you ask that feels better suited for the podcast, I will ask you if I have your permission to uh, share it on air with your your anonymity protected, of course, your privacy um, will remain intact. But um, I can't always respond to every single direct message with questions that I get. And using it to support all of you on this journey of reclaiming your life just feels like a really good idea. So... If you have a question that you want me to answer live here on air, email me, direct message me, contact me in whatever way feels good for you, and I will do my best. I'm collecting a lot of amazing questions um, that I can't wait to dive into. Now, really exciting news. This Sunday, doors are opening for my eighth cohort of Worthy Women Rise. That's right, people. This Sunday is my eighth cohort of Worthy Women Rise doors will be open. You can get on the wait list now by going to worthywomenrise.com. This program just keeps getting better and better. I've made some really amazing adjustments um, to the back end this time around that's going to make the user experience even more delightful. And mostly, I just can't wait to share with you incredible content to support you in deepening into your life so that you can address the emotional wounds that are keeping you up at night, that are keeping you spiraling in anxiety, that's um, keeping you in, in relationship distress and feeling like you hate your body and you hate your life. This program is for you. If you are feeling like the worthiness wound is just getting to the point where you want to do something about it, you want to learn a different way to relate to yourself, because that's what essentially this program is about, is learning a different way of relating to yourself, a foundational way in which you can approach yourself, approach your shadow, approach your integration that you can then use out into the future um, in supporting you to feel more human, to feel more human. What I mean by that is um, not to feel so plagued by our humanness, but to feel more accepting of our humanness um, so that you can go on and do the really big things that you want to do. So you can learn more about the program at worthywomenrise.com. So in honor of doors opening for Worthy Women Rise on Sunday, what I'm going to do next week is I'm not going to do a new episode. Instead, um, starting, let's see the calendar here, starting uh, August 13th, to the 23rd, I'm going to be re-releasing episodes of the Reclaiming Worth series. If you haven't heard about the Reclaiming Worth series, it's a 10-part series that I did here on this podcast, all about different tenets of reclaiming our worth. Um, And so I'm going to be relaunching them out into the world. I'm going to be adding fresh perspectives on my Instagram. 
I loved, love, love this series and I got a lot of amazing feedback that it really helped all of you. So I can't wait for you to hear it if you haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, follow me on Instagram at I am Thais Sky so you can be a part of the conversation because that's where it's going to be held. I'm going to be doing Facebook, um, not Facebook, Instagram lives. And I'm just going to be talking to you all about the stuff that I share and reclaiming worth and answering your questions and um, supporting you and living your best life. So uh, make sure that you follow me uh, on Instagram at I am Thais Sky so you can get all of the details as it happens. But just FYI, there will not be a new episode of uh, Reclaim launching next week in order to make space for this 10 part series that I'm going to be relaunching into the world. So just know that that is happening. Okay, so Yasmin is here. I am so excited to interview her on this podcast. Let me grab her uh, bio right now. It's quite short. Yasmin is um, Yasmin Cheyenne is a writer and spiritual teacher who helps people create their self healing practices. Through speaking, her workbook and courses, she helps her students navigate the sometimes tougher parts of self healing work. So this idea of self healing is is amazing. I love it. Um, It's the basic concept of like you have everything inside of you that you need to heal yourself. Um, We just maybe need some additional guidance and support on how to activate the resources we have within us. And that's what Yasmin does. And that's what this conversation is all about is how can you activate what is already within you for your own healing. And what I love about this is that it really um, speaks to this foundational truth that I believe that um, everything that is happening within us is moving towards our healing. You know, even stuff that have like PTSD of trauma, um, uh, intrusive thoughts, like reliving the same traumatic experience, like even though that's so horrendous and I, I know it's really, really painful, um, the brain is doing that for a reason. The brain is trying to relive those experiences to master it. Um, so even though like it may feel really, really painful and obviously we want to do what we can to tend to it. And, um, if you have severe symptoms of PTSD, getting help with a mental health practitioner is your best bet. Um, do not think you have to do this alone. Self-healing doesn't mean you have to do it alone, right? It means that, um, your body is leveraging resources inside of you to heal. Um, you know how to heal. Um, we just forgotten along the way. And so, of course, it's sometimes really, really helpful to have a guide to walk us on our journey. And that's what Yasmin does. That's what I do. That's what so many amazing women out there and men, um, not gender thing, um, out there does. So I love the concept of self healing because I love this idea that we are moving towards our greatest self. We really, really are. Sometimes though, we just have to learn how to get out of our own way. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Like what does self healing look like? What is, what happens when there's like hiccups and, um, places that we mess up? How can we tend to it so that we can, uh, show up in a really powerful way? Um, Okay, if you are interested in learning more about Yasmin, you're welcome to go to the show notes and you can go to her Instagram that I highly recommend and I rave throughout the episode. Um, And also you can go to her website. Um, And while you're listening to this interview, I would love for you to be thinking about what self-healing looks like for you. What feels healing for you? What have you found to have worked? What have you found to have not worked? Have you given yourself permission to let go of what hasn't and focus on what has? And what tweaks do you want to make to your self-healing practices to deepen your healing even further? All right, we're live. Hello, hello, my love. Thank you so much for being on Reclaim the Podcast. You're welcome. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I read your bio, but for people who want to know a little bit more about you, about your work, about your presence in the world, share for them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a writer. I'm a spiritual teacher. And basically, I help people create their own self-healing kind of toolkit, so to speak. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but really what keeps us from, you know, jumping into our work is not knowing where to start or what to do or when to do it. So I help people figure that out. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those are right there. Like you said, it so <laughs> casually, but those questions are like the big, big, big questions when it comes to doing our healing work. Cause it's like, where on earth do we start? Right. So what, how do you typically answer that question? Typically we start with what's up right now Mm -hmm. because what's up right now is what's up 
usually in different areas that are showing up in different versions of themselves. Um, and we may think, you know, it's just, oh, it's my mom or, oh, it's my boyfriend or it's dating. But it's really, you know, one thing, how we, how we do one thing is how we do everything. And so if we start with one thing, we can usually begin to see where our cycles and patterns live and how yeah. they become uh, bigger versions of themselves in fancier new ways. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I do. I love, you know, I love that because I think so often that people, when they're starting on their own healing path, they think that it has to be this fancy thing. Like, oh, I have to immediately now address like these deeper wounds when in fact, all in order to start, you just have to look at where are you most activated in your life right now? Even if it's something benign as a fight with a partner or, you know, you getting bothered by a colleague at work, like these little things are the big things. Yes. Um, and they begin to seep into our lives and we begin to create stories about them and why they're happening and what the, what people mean and why we think people mean what they mean. Um, and before you know it, you believe it and it's turned into this whole thing. Um, and all of these things are valid, but what's important is to figure out why is this thing up for me right now? How can I move through it? How can I understand it? How can I not absorb all of my life so that I can experience joy, connection, mm-hmm. love, vulnerability? Um, all of the things that we really want, but often we get kind of distracted from by focusing mm-hmm. on what seems bigger, more important, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, no, I really hear that. So how did you get started in all of this? Like what, what does your journey look like? Yeah, so I, I definitely believe that first, I think I had pieces of this in me my whole life, but I do think it showed up from a unhealthy perspective, basically codependently in a lot of different relationships. I was uh, mm-hmm. using this, um, I think it's a gift that I was given to be able to help people figure out their lives, and, uh, but it was in an unhealthy way. And after having kind of like my own kind of breakdown, so to speak, with the, I say breakdown casually because there's been several iterations of this breakdown, but the big one when <laughs> the depression and the anxiety hit, um, and it was a really scary time. And I think diving into my own self work, I realized, you know, how much I enjoyed doing this for other people. I had been doing it in different ways and work that I had done before, and so this was my, you know, gateway into really diving into it and forming a a business around supporting people through that. Mm. So mm-hmm. it was like the, it was the depression and anxiety that kind of opened you up, so to speak. It cracked me right open. Um, and I won't say that like depression and anxiety led to like, Oh, everything is clear now. It was like, everything is murky. I can't see straight. How can I find my way to the top of this mm-hmm. or just how can I find my, how can I figure out how to stand in this was really probably the first step. Um, and, and as I began to do my own self-healing work, um, I really began to just get drawn into uh, energy work and uh, spiritual healing. And, and I begin to use my writing that I, you know, I've been writing since I was nine, but I, I begin to use my writing as a self-healing tool for myself. Mm. You know, this is before, Instagram. This is before, you know, we were sharing in this kind of way um, on social media. And so that was kind of my starting point for what people get to see today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think for so many people, it's so easy to kind of um, fall. Like, how do I, like, I'm imagining this like spiral and like, you're either spiraling down or spiraling upward. You're either kind of continuing to like con- like go along the way that you always have been um mm-hmm. which is leading you further and further down depression and anxiety or you kind of use this depression anxiety whatever is coming up for you as a catalyst to spiral upwards into a new perspective a new way of living a new way of understanding yourself is what i'm hearing you say yeah i, I agree with that and i think that those spirals if you if we use that as like um the visual i think that they always are with us so mm-hmm the depression and anxiety can, can begin to take hold and I can begin to spiral down again. I think that the healing process, the way I teach it is definitely ebbs and flows. I don't think you can ever just be healed. 
Mm -hmm. or you're not living or you're not being realistic or being honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. If you think that you're on the other side, I think we all have our things and they come up in new and different and interesting, but difficult ways. And so when we begin to get in that downward spiral, so to speak, that's when the tools that we've created or the community that we've created, you know, begins to be essential in helping us to get back to the top part again. Yeah, I love that. And, um, you know, it's really interesting how um, it, it, we often do find and find ourselves believing that there's a destination in all of this, you mm-hmm. know, that once we kind of go through the internal process, we're healed, boom, done, everything's great, yeah. we're going to have manifested our perfect partner, we'll have our great job, and like we're kind of done forever and ever. Right. <laughs> if only that were true, I'd probably be a trillionaire. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, one of the hardest things I think in this work, especially for the women that I work with, is once we start doing the things and we're setting the boundaries and all that stuff, it's like, where, where's my partner? Or, I, you know, I'm yes. still not happy in my marriage or yeah. I still don't have the best friend I was hoping for. I, my job still sucks. And the biggest piece of this work is that, well, first of all, it takes us to take the action because manifestation, things do happen. The universe does work on our behalf, but usually the universe is working on our behalf when we're actually actively taking action in some way to help us get to the place that we need to be. I think that one of the most important things in uh, wellness, energy, spirituality is the reminder that we have free will. So nothing is happening um, that we want to to bring into our lives without us actually actively wanting to help have it happen as well. Now things happen, people get fired, you get divorced, you know, terrible things happen and that's just life. But I think the big piece about alignment is understanding that a big part of it comes from your choice as well. And mm-hmm. so that's not to say that you don't have your partner because it's not, you're, you're not doing the right things or you don't have your dream job because you're not doing the right things. But timing is important too. And the patience and it, it's the, the biggest piece I think to take away from this is what you thought your life may look like and what the universe, God wants your life to look like or what your purpose actually is may be very different. And sometimes there's a grief process in accepting Yes. From what you wanted it to be. Mm. Yes, 100%. I talk about this grief process often. I think it's kind of an underlooked but really critical component of our healing is that there is, we must let go. And in that letting go, there is sadness, there is grief. Mm -hmm. I think we often talk about letting go as kind of like such a trite thing, like just let it go. But, (laughs) right. But the fact of the matter is, if it was that easy to let go, we would have let go already. We're mm-hmm. holding on. And I think part of that holding on is because we're terrified to be in right. grief at the loss of what we're letting go. I agree. And I think even more so too, um, we're ter- the grief comes from acceptance. Mm. And so I think we're often terrified to accept what is in front of us because yeah. then, it's, then it's real. Yes. Um, it, we can live in our stories and our, I call it like our fantasy life. People can live in their fantasy life for their whole lives. Yes. Um, so when you grieve, it, there's a lot of uh, bravery in choosing to see what's real. So you can yeah. move forward. Yeah. It is pretty remarkable. And I'm sure that you've seen it for yourself and in the people that you work with, how like tantalizing it is to live in fantasy. Mm-hmm. It's super sexy. It is. It's so sexy. Talk a little bit about that. I think fantasy is, um, well, we're kind of taught to live in fantasy. The television, and I I could just imagine today, you know, with social media and things like that, kids growing up in this kind of environment where we are curating uh, kind of a lifestyle with a small view. So this, this, uh, happily ever after in all things, in all ways, kind of idea is something that we're kind of groomed around, especially here in, um, in the, you know, 
it's the US, UK, things like that. Like this is what we see on television. Um, and so when we have to be realistic about, you know, and, and usually for a lot of women, it starts to happen as that time clock, this crazy, it's true, there is a time clock, but the time clock that society places on us, yes, um, we begin to think, you know, the things that maybe we never even really wanted, mm-hmm. but we begin to think about the, the, the fairy tale. It comes back. It's like, wait, am I going to have this, this Prince Charming? Am I going to have the kids? You know, am yes. I going to do the things? And in some cases, it's like, you know what? This time clock is real for me. I do want to do these things. And there's some shifts that happen. But I think overwhelmingly, the fantasy becomes the reality. And sometimes we don't realize we're living in the fantasy and fulfilling the fantasy and the truth, what we really want, what we really uh, strive to have for our lives, we're not even clear on um, yes. because we've never been given the space yeah. to really explore that. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. It's interesting. Like I shared in the episode before this about saving ourselves and like we have to we have to be our own advocates. We have to save ourselves. No one's coming to save us. And mm-hmm. I see a big area of my life where this plays out is I'm in a relationship. I've been in a relationship for uh, about a year now. And mm-hmm. I notice myself being like, when is he going to marry me? Like, mm-hmm. when, when are we going to get married? You know, I'm, I'm 30. So I think mm-hmm. uh, like societally speaking, this is kind of the place in our lives where we're thinking that we need to be married by now. It's not mm-hmm. even like we want to be married. It's we need to be married by now because that means something. It means that we're successful. It means that we're on track with our lives. Anyway, mm-hmm. so I noticed myself like being like, when is he going to marry me? And then spiraling in the sense of like, he's never going to marry me. I'm never going to get married. And then the most amazing thing happens when I start to investigate these thoughts, I can really sit with the fact that actually this is nothing to do with him marrying me and everything to do with this fantasy that I have that if he marries me, then I'll be safe. I'll be right. taken care of. I will never have to worry about my relationship again. I can check that box off and never have to be sad, you know, never be lonely, never be whatever again. And those things, it's an illusion, but it's such a tantalizing fantasy. It's so tantalizing. And, you know, I, what I, I often tell my clients when we're working through this, specifically marriage or relationships, I'm like, and then you get married and you're like, oh my God, are we going to get divorced? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God, are we going to have kids? Like it just, comp- it, it evolves. And um, yeah. it's, it's so interesting how, um, how our, how our, our wanting to be safe can begin to become a way that we create fear. Yes. And anxiety and, you know, all the things. A hundred percent. And, you know, if we don't question it, if we think, oh, it's, it, it must be because I want to get married, then we're missing the point, right? And I think that that's what you're talking about at the very beginning, which is like, we got to start with what's coming up for us right now. You know, this is what's coming up in my life right now is this desire. And that's my opportunity then to go and investigate deeper about where I want to be saved, where I'm, I somehow believe also that patriarchy is going to save me, right? Because I, I'm somehow believing that if I get married, then I will be a, an acceptable woman in our society that I will be seen as successful by society. It's also participating in a construct. Marriage is a social construct. It doesn't actually have inherent meaning beyond what we give it. And so there's so many elements of it that I can explore and I can look within myself if I'm choosing that. Um, But it has to be that choice versus just believing that, oh, I just want it to be about marriage. I just want him to marry me. I agree. And I think the biggest question I always ask myself when that safety comes up is like, well, where is it that I'm feeling unsafe? Yeah. Like, why am I striving for safety in this? And then also I think the redefinition, like for me, I've been married. I married, <laughs> I've been married, I married. <laughs> and um, I think re- re- like we were in this constant redefinition of what our relationship is for us, what we mm. need. And I think it's important to like even in these social constructs that for a lot of us actually mean something. It's like, okay, this could be, you know, a social construct or this could be a part of, a, you know, a patriarchal uh, subculture. You know, it could be all of these different labels that, you know, we do need to identify. And then also they could also be things that mean something to us. And that's okay too. Yes. But then it's like within that, how do I define this in a way that meets what we need versus meeting what society wants it to mean or what other people want it to mean or what my family says it should mean. Yeah. Um, 
and I think that's important too. Yeah. And I think that um, for many of us that don't want to participate in these social constructs, you know, whether we don't want it or be, or we, who we are, isn't participatory, right? Like our identity, mm-hmm. let's say it's not heteronormative. You know, it's like, we have a responsibility for ourselves and our fellow humans to really, to really tend to those places and live our lives on our own terms. I mean, again, I know that sounds cliche, but like, it is so important because if we don't we're going to feel so constricted and narrow and small. And it's, it's super radical, like choosing. And it's hard as hell because you will have people. I mean, you can set up all the boundaries you want and there will be people in your life that you don't want to get rid of. And they are not going to understand why you're choosing to live the way you do. I know that's definitely true for my life. And I'm constantly learning, you know, with, things that I have in place or as I'm shifting through or moving through life, I'm like, you know, what does this mean to me now? I mean, six months ago, I thought that I had this pretty much figured out. And now six six months later, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I think it's just this constant ebb and flow of being curious about why things are feeling the way they're feeling, how we can begin to move through it in a way that feels good for the moment yeah. and knowing that at some point we may have to revisit it. And that's a part of the work and living. And I think that's the part that's also frustrating because it's like, I don't want to continue to keep having to look at this over and over again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you don't have to, by the way, yeah. it's completely a choice. Yeah. Um, but Yeah. It's just, I think it's, it's like one of those other kind of unspoken expectations that we have on our healing work is that once we address something once, it's kind of, t- it's done. Right. You know, it's kind of taken care of. Phew, again, checkbox. You can just kind of like move yeah. onward. And yet what the truth of the matter is, is that we're revisiting, just like you said, the same mm-hmm. thing over and over and over again, going on a deeper layer each time mm-hmm. we do so. And so there has to be so much compassion. And actually, you wrote something um, that I think is really poignant. I, Of course, I'm a big fan of your Instagram. And um, you wrote, we have to learn to be willing to love ourselves through what we're asking others to love us through too. Yeah. And, and that is, um, it's super again, sexy to want somebody to give you, to love you through this tough yes. thing or this yes. tough part or all of that stuff. Like choose me. Cause a lot of the, especially for women, the marriage piece is about, I would like to be chosen. Yes. I want to be the one. I want to be safe. I want to be the prince, like all of the things. The princess. And, and <laughs> the princess. And part of this is like, okay, some of this sh- can matter to you. And it could be really a fun and amazing and important. And also it's like, how are you also showing up for yourself in those same ways, loving yourself in the same way that you're asking, you know, this, your husband, your fiance, your girlfriend, your mom, you know, how are you also doing your best to look at yourself with that same love yeah. and that same, uh, just kind of compassion. And I think that, it's tough to do because often we're trying to get the other person to kind of quiet the noise that is us and yes. some of it, not us, but the stuff in our head kind of get, try to get that to, to calm down. And, and, and those are the pieces that we need to be also looking at for ourselves. Um, it's not super enticing to want to do that because when we like, especially for people who are dating, when you're in a new relationship, for example, all that noise goes away and everything's perfect for like four or five months. Yeah. And so you think you're fixed. Yes. <laughs> um, and then you have your first fight and you're like, everything sucks again. Nothing yeah. nice. I don't enjoy my life. And, and those are those indications in those times where it's like, this is me that needs to be looking at me versus trying to get anything, a job, a, a degree, a, a man, a woman to come in and make everything okay because that's just not realistic unless you are underage because then your parents can do that for you um, and can help you and can guide you through that. But if you are an adult, then it's, it's a part of your responsibility to be there for yourself. And it's, it's tough. 
It is child really that doesn't want that. Yes, a hundred percent. And also, I think one of the scariest experiences, honestly, I mean, maybe not one of the a, a scary experience that I think some of us have in relationship is that sense that we are so alone. So oh, yeah. we feel isolated and alone within a relationship. And I think we sometimes think that if we have this feeling, it's because we're not in the right relationship. Because if we were in the right relationship, we would never feel alone. We would never feel this way. Um, but that's just not the case. It's so not the case. I mean, I could probably talk about this for like a long time, but that is like key. When you're in relationship or when you have your friends or when you find your people, your person, your things, your career, and you still feel that loneliness, it's, there's something there for you to look at, whether it's your 12 year old self, you know, Mm -hmm. the part of you that's, you know, longing for a better relationship with your dad, a part of you that's dealing with, you know, whatever it is that is trying to call your attention to that piece of yourself, it's looking for you. And, and, and this is not to say that, you have to only take care of you. Connection is important. Community is important. And having people you can reach out to and trusting others is also important. But you have to know what you need to be able to even ask for what you need from other people yeah. in your community and things like that. Yeah. Um, and when we don't know, usually it comes out in other ways like passive aggression, projection, <laughs> codependency, lack of boundaries. Like we begin saying, I will just give all of myself so I can feel full or I'll just take all of their stuff. So I don't feel full or, you know, we're, we're operating in the cycles we've been taught versus the reprogramming and operating from a place of filling ourselves up, which is the goal to learn how to fill ourselves up. Yes. Yes. And I, I think the beauty about relationships, I'm, I'm glad that we're kind of talking about this because I think the beauty of relationship is that we get to learn what it means to be loved, you mm-hmm. know? And if we feel this huge well of unlovability, I think it's beautiful to have someone reflect to us, actually, you are lovable. Look, I'm here. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we can't rely on that fully. We also have to learn how to cultivate that within ourselves. You know, as they say, you know, we can't really love others unless we love ourselves. Well, I think it's beautiful if other people love us to, to kind of cultivate that within ourselves, but we also do have to do that work of, of looking within ourselves or else it's very, very hard for us to really accept that other person and to um, accept them as who they are. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, that, that saying, um, you, we can't love others if we don't love ourselves, comes from reciprocity and uh, healthy exchange and boundaries. Like if you're not showing up for yourself, then most likely you don't even have the capacity to show up for someone else. Yes. else. So it's, it's, it's not that you can't be loved, but the, the feeling of, um, of allowing yourself to really be present to love is so overwhelming. And, um, and, and most of us don't know that we're actually afraid of it. We, we, yeah. we want it, we're asking for it, we're calling it in, but some, and I'm not saying this for, for everyone, but what I've noticed, even for myself, what I thought it was has changed over time and a lot of fantasy, societal, a lot of stuff has been wrapped up in it versus now what it is at this moment. And I'm sure in yeah. five, 10 years, it'll be <laughs> something yeah. else. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, we often talk about um, the importance of like placing boundaries around other people. Mm-hmm. I don't, we don't, I don't hear so many people talk about the importance of knowing that if we're placing boundaries for other people, that means we also have to respect their boundaries. Mm-hmm. You know, and you've written, you've written this. I'm like, I'm going to quote you all day here because I love Instagram so much. Um, you can't make anyone meet you where you are what you can do is accept their capacity or let them go. And I think I'm, it's the same thing of like, it, we're so quick to say to put up boundaries, but it's very hard for us to really understand other people's boundaries and then to understand our limitations within that and other people's limitations and find a way to tango in that dance of finding what's right for us. Yes, I agree. I think, I think a lot of times too, societally, when people say they're putting up boundaries, what they're actually putting up is barriers or what I call yes. barriers, which is walls. Yes. Yes. And um, Rach. it's not the same. And so same. when we put up healthy boundaries, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with barriers. Mm-hmm. It's just that 
barriers don't allow us to access our work and our emotions as freely as we can when we have boundaries in place. There are circumstances where barriers is all you can do. But I say that to say um, it's important to, to learn how to accept people as they come, because mm-hmm. that's all we literally can do. Like mm-hmm. there is nothing else that you can do. You can't force people to change. You can't convince them. You can pay for, you know, therapy, this, 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 and this. And, and honestly, unless they have made the decision to do it, signed up for it this lifetime to do it, it's not going to happen. And so what we're really saying is I'm going to, I want to put this ultimatum in place to kind of either trick, bribe, yes. force, or coerce you into choosing me because I want you to choose me because yeah. probably I love you. I need you, you know, whatever it is. But honestly, the self boundary that needs to be put in place is I will only show up with people the way that they have shown me they can show up mm-hmm. with me. Mm-hmm. And it's not tit for tat. It's actually respecting the person that you're in relationship with and understanding that this is the most that they can do right now. And, um, and also respecting and giving yourself compassion in that you won't be expecting things from them that they can't give. And that's usually where the boundary, the self boundary and respecting their boundaries comes in. And so I think that takes time to understand, especially in those really, really difficult and close relationships, like a parent, sibling, and even in marriage, you know, you get into a relationship with someone and you don't realize five years down the line that they don't have any emotional capacity because you were, you know, sprung off the ring and the dating and the fairy tale. And then you get, now you have kids and, you know, you realize, wow, they don't have the emotional capacity. I thought they did. There's just so many levels of, of learning to accept people. And then from there deciding, how are you going to show up in this? And how does, how does this look for you? Because mm-hmm. the focus is always usually on how I'm going to get them to do whatever, but yes. really the, the, the conversation is how am I going to do this now? Yes. Yeah. And I find exactly what you're talking about happens insidiously in my relationship all the time where I'm like, why did I just withdraw love from this person at this moment? Oh, it's because I'm hoping that if I withdraw love, I will change their behavior, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, or like I'll... I'll like not tell them what I want, what I need. And then when they can't read my mind, you know, then I get upset with them almost because like I expect them to read my mind, which is a very important thing as children. It's like our mother's ability to kind of quote unquote read our minds is critical for us as children. But then if we're continuing to do that as adults, we're kind of maintaining a sense of immaturity in our lives where we're punishing people for not knowing how to meet our needs. It's true. And I think um, even, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom and I think um, I never thought of it that way, me reading my kids' minds. I guess I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's more so the important piece with, with kids is like as a mom, I am charged, so to speak, with meeting all of their needs, physical yes. needs, clothing, you know, emotional needs, and also, you know, providing for them. And when we come into relationship with those same expectations, that right there is where we, you know, like where the, where the, where we should stop yeah. because a partner, you know, it's a hundred, 100. And so with that in mind, you give yourself 100% of what you need. Your partner gives themselves 100% of what they need. And then you guys decide what you give each other. And every relationship is completely different. Um, and I think that for, for me and my marriage, I definitely had a lot of what you're talking about in the beginning where I was looking for those kind of things to be met. And then over time we had to begin to redefine like, Hey, I don't even like doing this. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because we thought that this is what we were supposed to be doing because this is what people do when they're married and have kids. Um, and I, and I think that's been really interesting for us to walk through. We definitely don't have it figured out by any such as the imagination, but I do think that learning that there is a child part of me that needs to be taken care of. However, I don't nec- I'm, he's married to adult Yasmin. Yes. Not the, the, he is, those other parts of me are there, but I come to him as an, as the adult version of myself. 
Mm. versus the child part of myself that's looking for the things that, you know, he could never give that child part of myself, those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that seemed to help me remember, wow, that's because it's my, it's my responsibility. It's different for everyone, but I thought that was really important to share because, um, it was something I definitely was looking for. Yeah, no, I think it's so important for all of us to remember that, you know, at the end of the day, like we have a responsibility to show up as adults if we are adults and wherever we're not showing up as adults, which, you know, if we're unconscious, it's, it's most of the time. And as we become conscious, you know, our inner ch- and do the inner child work, it becomes a, a little bit less, we become more and more adults in our lives. But I really appreciate you saying that because, you know, knowing that it's a responsibility that I show up as an adult in my partnership and in my relationships and my, you know, in my life means that now the onus is on me to tending to my inner child even more so than kind of hoping or expecting that my partner somehow is going to father me or mother me or, or mm-hmm. take, own, take care of my little one. It's like, no, no, no. She is my responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's tough lots of fights and, and unspoken arguments that none of us even know what we're fighting about <laughs> because yes. of this like internal energetic exchange. And most, most of the time it's probably like even his little person inside is like, no, like I have my own little person to deal with. I can't take care of your little person, my little person and the real little people we have in the world. It's so <laughs> interesting. You know, it's so interesting to see that dynamic in the part of us that's just kind of like, no, you're going to take this. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing about relationships too. It's like when we're in conflict with our partner, when we're fighting, you know, it's that most of the things that we're fighting about isn't what we're actually fighting about. Mm -hmm. And it's like so hard to detach ourselves. Wait, I know that we're fighting about this silly little thing, but that's actually not what we're talking. That's not what's happening here. Like, let's actually get to the root of what the issue is. Yes. Yes. I've learned with myself um, that my anxiety is usually an indication of the fact that I've been ignoring something that wants to come forward. Mm. And I don't always know what it is. I'm like, I mean, if I knew what it was, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to sit down and journal about it. So this anxiety can just go, but I don't always know what it is. And, um, and then the next step is usually me us arguing about something very small, the trash, you know, did you leave the sponge in the wrong spot? It's those small little things that I'm just looking. And, 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 and usually, I mean, that doesn't happen as much anymore, but you, what it used to be is I would look for a way for a fight to take place so that I could have the permission yes. to talk about what's really bothering me. may not even mm-hmm. have anything to do with my relationship. And unfortunately, when we're in relationships, partnerships, we, they usually get the brunt of the crap. <laughs> Mm-hmm. because unfortunately they're just in the house. If Just like when you're growing up with a sibling, your sibling gets the crap because your sibling's the closest person there and, they, and they're getting all the stuff. So I had to really learn how to say, I need some space this morning or I need to space some space this afternoon to kind of walk myself through what I need. And it's, it doesn't always have to be a, um, a conversation afterwards. I don't have to divulge what I work through. Like, relationships. And for me, marriage doesn't mean 100,000%. I have to divulge every single thought, thing, idea that comes to my mind. Um, and I think those, even those self boundaries help us to discern, like, what do I actually need to talk about? What isn't important for me to talk about? Like really just beginning to, I think we think of boundaries of like, that person is not welcome here, or that kind of behavior is not welcome here. And sometimes it's just about how we take care of each other. And how we show up for each other and how we're, you know, how we communicate with each other. It isn't always about pushing someone out or, you know, changing a, a negative. Sometimes it's about cultivating positive ways to interact um, yes. in a relationship as well. Yeah. I'm so glad that you made that point. Again, I think we often see boundaries as barriers. And so we see it as a way that we um, kind of punish people for not doing what we want to do. But actually boundaries is really an expansion of our capacity to love because Mm -hmm. 
we're creating safe containers in which we can be seen and can be heard. Um, mm-hmm. And that means practicing those skills of listening, of being tender. You know, I notice myself sometimes getting so angry and um, recognizing that I'm putting my anger onto this person, but this person is not the, the core of my anger. You know, right. and that like this fight that we're having, this conflict that we're having, it's about this conflict because like, yeah, there's a problem here that we need to address, but it's also the emotional contagion tells me that there's something deeper and that it's not fair, you know, for my partner, for me to not be investigating what that is. Right. Right. I agree. I agree. And, and I think sometimes it's them just wanting to, you know, know more or help or whatever. Um, but I, I'm the type of, in, in, in my relationship and in the way that I teach too, it's like, it's really important to say, Hey, you know, this, I was going through something and I'm not in a space to really talk about it. I think that communication is important too. Yes. Right? Cause then we create stories about, uh Oh, she's thinking about divorce. Or, I mean, you'd be surprised <laughs> where yeah. people's minds go. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. I was just, you know, thinking about, you know, decluttering my house, decluttering the house, but I wasn't ready to share it yet because I knew you were going to be upset about the project it was going to take. But then, you know, days and days of us withholding that information, they start creating a story. And so we don't have a responsibility to uh, keep them from creating stories. But we, I think we do have somewhat of a responsibility to communicate in a way that creates, you know, like the, you said, the container of communication that we both agreed upon in the relationship. I'm and, so glad that you said that because... Yeah. You know, something that is helpful for me to do when I'm in conflict with my partner is to say, like, the story that's running in my head about this is, Mm -hmm. you know, the story that I'm believing about what you said. And it's so critical. And because, you know, I, my big wound in relationship is abandonment wound. And Mm -hmm. so it's very easy for my partner to rub up on that bad boy and for me to get so activated, for me to completely shut down or, you know, whatever my response is. And so being able to say, like, when you do this, the story that I'm saying to myself is that you're about to leave, like mm-hmm. leave for good. There was, uh, <laughs> this sounds silly, but my partner and I got into a conflict and we both needed some space. We needed some, some time to kind of breathe and like think about what's going on, like, or else we were going to say things that we regretted. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I, he was like, you know, I, I'm going to go grocery shopping. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go grocery shopping. I'll be back in, you know, in an hour. And I said to him, I, I am so glad that you're going grocery shopping because we really need the groceries and um, I'm glad that you're doing that. Um, There's a part of me that's worried that if you leave, you're never coming back. And I just needed to say it in that moment because if I didn't say it, then that story was going to consume me. And just by saying it, I got to feel, you know, how that wasn't true. I got to feel how that story, saying it out loud, was actually not the story that I wanted to run my life. Um, right. And so it wasn't even about his response or reassurance. It was really about just naming, hey, listen, this is the story and I'm going to say it so it, it has less power over me. Um, right. And of course, it's also helpful to have my partner have said, I'm just going grocery shopping. I will be back, you know, and, and it assures me. And now I get to spend that time assuring my little girl, like, I'm okay. If he doesn't leave, if he doesn't come back, I will be okay. It doesn't right. mean that you know, I now have to go into my, you know, uh, five-year-old response to this. I'm now an adult. I can, I can handle this. Right. And that letting, you know, letting her take the back seat, so to speak, is the, is the, is how, you know, like you're making some super progress (laughs) because in the beginning, I didn't even know that there was a little girl. I was like, no, this is real. This is happening. Yes. This is what, you know, this is, it's interesting, you know, um, the way that what we imagine or the stories we create feel so real to the point where <laughs> yes. when you're out of your story and you're looking at it, you're like, wow, I created that. Yes. <laughs> There's no yes. fact yes. to any of this. Yes. Um, and it's, that's how powerful we really, we really are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it is pretty remarkable about how real it feels. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we don't want to say it out loud. Because we, there's a part of us that wants it to be real so that it can affirm the belief that life isn't to be trusted, that we will be abandoned, that, you know, we can't, um, we can't be supported, et cetera. And so by saying the story out loud, by losing its power, we're actually overcoming a huge hurdle um, and committing to see our lives differently. 
I agree. And I think, you know, depending on the relationship, you know, cause like sometimes people need space or sometimes people, you know, cause usually when there's a dynamic with one person having abandonment or one person having codependency or whatever it is, the other person fits perfectly in the cycle so that you can have yeah. the cycle, the pattern. Yes. So it can go round and round. And so if we're playing this one role, then most likely you know, if we're playing the one role in our lives for them, we're playing the role that they're afraid of, whatever yeah. that is and yeah. vice versa. And so, um, I think that's something that I've also learned to make really important remembering that I'm not the only one having an experience. Like I, I think, you know, I get, you know, we get so caught up and we're like, I feel this and I feel that. And, and often, especially, um, men are not as likely to <laughs> say, I feel abandoned. I feel afraid, you know, so they're just kind of trying to hold it all together and hoping that we can just move on most likely um, from wherever we're at. But I I, I started reminding myself that I'm not the only one having any experience here. Like this is also probably scary in some form to him. And I, and I try to give space for us to both have our space. So then we can come back together and have a conversation about what's actually taking place versus what I think is taking place for me and what I think he did intentionally to hurt me that actually yes. had nothing to do with anything other than um, me being triggered by something he said that created a story about something that has nothing to do with what's taking place at this moment. Obviously, yeah. sometimes it's real. There was something hurtful said, and then we have to deal with those kind of things. But for the most part, I find um, with the stories that we were talking about, it's usually it it has it's completely unrelated the story yes. and what took place and where we go with it yeah um yeah oh yes 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 and it's you know it's so wild how tr- i i know i'm repeating what you just said but i i have to it's so wild how real the stories feel i mean sometimes i'm like you hate me Mm-hmm. That's how I feel. I feel like you absolutely hate me. When you do this, I feel like it's a malicious intent and that you hate me. <laughs> yeah. And then my partner looks at me and he's like, I don't hate you. I do yeah. that because it's an unconscious blah, blah, blah. Like it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> and, you know, I like twist the narrative. I twist the reality to try to match. No, no, no. It's because you hate me. And it takes a lot of compassion for myself to really sit with the fact of like, oh my God, what if he doesn't hate me? You know, what, what am I, it, what is the fear of what I will experience if I let this go? And I think more importantly too, like for me, what, what am I feeling about me? Cause usually like I'm, projecting especially you know sometimes it's a trigger and then and then other times i'm projecting i might be having a lot of not so nice feelings about myself and this is a perfect opportunity for me to take something and this is of course for me anyway it's all unconscious i have no idea i'm doing this i think that what he said actually pissed me off and hurt me and now i want to have a whole conversation about the story that I created within a matter of 26 seconds um, based on this interaction that we had. But, but actually, you know, I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling whatever I'm feeling. And sometimes we do create opportunities to cause conflict so that we have the permission to talk about, like I kind of talked about this earlier, but um, it is a form of projection um, and it is a form of, um, just an unhealthy way of looking for a way it's you know almost fishing for an opportunity to talk about something that isn't real and i de- i think i definitely did this uh more in the beginning of our relationship it's been a long time since we had an experience like this but nonetheless um that part of me still sometimes wants to come up and and i just now have the tools to be like yes yeah, what's actually going on here like because what he just said that he'd rather watch the game than go for a walk has nothing to do with this story you were about to create. So what's yeah. actually happening here? Oh, I'm just lonely. Okay. Yeah. So say, can we hang out after the game? Yeah. Boom. Done. Yeah. But before that would have become, why don't you ever want to spend time? Why don't you ever want to hang out? I feel alone. You know, yes. I feel like you don't really want this relationship. Is this really yes. what you want? 
Yes. Like, <laughs> are we getting, are we actually getting married or is the game going to be more important? Like, it yes. would just, you know, be it's like a this crisis. Whole, it becomes it, a crisis. It becomes a crisis. And then yeah. it's like now, like, Hey, I'll see you after the game. Cool. But it takes a long time to get to yes. that point. And I think, yeah. especially for me, I consider myself at the time more of a independent woman. So I'd be like, Oh, you want to watch the game? That's fine. This week I'm leaving to New York for three days. Not because I'm like trying to consciously, you know, uh, hurt or anything like that. But for my own self, I felt like I constantly had to prove to myself mm. that I didn't need anyone mm-hmm. because needing someone was how you could get hurt. And that was not a healthy way to be in relationship. One, uh, my partner felt, I mean, I was obviously doing a good job because he really felt like I didn't need him. But also, um, I wasn't allowing myself to really be open to the type of relationship we could have if I admitted to myself that, yeah, I do need him and it's okay and it feels good and I can still be independent and enjoy meeting my partner in these particular kinds of ways and also give to myself in these ways and have friends and have my own individual life. Like it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Yes. Um, Yes. And that's, I think has been like kind of my goal in relationships moving forward is that conflict doesn't equal crisis that because this person isn't doing what I want or because he's behaving in a way that's activating me because we're feeling distant right now because we're not feeling connected doesn't mean it has to be a crisis over the relationship. It doesn't have to equal, oh my gosh, is this, are we breaking up? We can have conversations about whether or not we're feeling good in the relationship, what can be adjusted, what can be changed without that conversation being, are we breaking up? Is this over? You know, type of thing. And I think that, like you said, that takes a great deal of work because when we're in our activated, you know, fight, fight, freeze response, you know, we see things as black and white. Our prefrontal cortex is shut down. We're feeling like Mm -hmm. life or death right now. And so slowly doing the work of healing ourselves and being in the relationship while we're healing and being in conversation kind of acts to like soothe the nervous system so that we can then be open in these dialogues without it being so ginormous. And I think that that is such a beautiful goal for us to be um, caring and holding close to our hearts. I agree. I think, um, you know, Brene Brown's work of vulnerability really helped me understand that you could be strong and all of the other things, resilient, you know, independent, so to speak, and also be vulnerable in a relationship and that being vulnerable did not make me weaker, which is what I really, really believed, Mm -hmm. but it allowed me to be stronger and have the type of connection that I was looking for and that I was actually requesting and requiring in a really, the, in really the opposite way (laughs) of what you would do if you were seeking vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was just a matter of not knowing. And I think we can admit what we need and where we were falling short, so to speak, because being honest with ourselves allows us to make the changes and shifts that we need. But you can also hold compassion for yourself without shaming yourself about the way that you show up. But I think it's important to, to truth, truthfully admit it. Um, you know, looking towards the positive um, and trying to just move on and, you know, see things from the bright side is not how you get to the other side, in my opinion. I think you have to not walk through your entire past but you at least have to be honest about what's going on in the present and, mm-hmm. and then make those changes and then go from there. Um, I think spirituality sometimes can get caught up in the, you know, manifestation, the positivity, blah, 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 blah. And that's all important. And sometimes you have to call shit, shit, and then yeah. you can walk through it and move to the other side. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I love this so much. I feel like we could just be in conversation all day. I really appreciate all of your amazing insights. Um, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners before we wrap up? No, this was a really good conversation. Um, oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your work on um, self-healing. I recommend everybody to go to your Instagram. I will link the show notes because I just find your 
your presence online to be so soothing. And it's just every time your words come up, I'm like, ah, oh, yes, this is good. This is holy. Um, so I appreciate your work endlessly. Thank you so much for all you do. And um, you. yeah, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Reclaim the Podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of Tae Sky and her guests to the show. The content of this podcast are for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological, psychiatric, or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified mental health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or mental disorder.